fantastic. In science fiction and fantasy, there are often incredible constructs. What do you need to keep in mind when building the fantastic so that those in the know don't throw your book across the room in disgust? Now, I will put a, one qualifier on this. For purposes of this uh, discussion, magic is a science. Basically, if you're doing a magical construct, the same basic rules aside uh, apply as if you're doing a scientific one. Um, magic is technology. Good examples of uh, somebody who takes this to heart of the idea that technology has got to be consistent within the structure, the structure of a fictional piece is, of course, my own works available for sale. <laughs> um, yes, I am self-promoting to people. Um, why, and surprisingly enough, uh, some, who here has seen The Last Airbender? Okay. You watch that with a view to how the writers have taken the fact that there are these extraordinary abilities, the ability to bend the various forms of matter, and just incorporated it in subtle ways into their world. Uh, one of the great examples is um, the trains in Ba Sing Se, where they have the earth benders who are kicking these big rock constructs along the track. But if you have the ability to bend earth to affect matter in the way that they do, that's a perfectly logical application. And this is really an example of one of the main issues I have with a lot of science fiction. And it's easy to say, place, it's always easy to pick, but to look at ones that are bad examples, anything in the Marvel or DC universe. Battlestar Galactica is another bad example, another example of it being done badly, because they advance a technology in one area and don't do anything to address the implications of that technology throughout the rest of their world. I, if you had uh, the arc reactor that Tony Stark has designed and built in the real world, hey, energy problems, they're gone. I mean, you get, you've completely revolutionized what we do. Aircraft are flying without fuels. The oil companies have all gone bankrupt. Uh, you're not having to worry about putting up windmills or solar panels because there's this wonderful clean source of eternal perpetual power, which also breaks several of the rules of, rules of thermodynamics and uh, comes out as being, in the end, an impossible technology that we just sort of say, yeah, but the dramatic line is good, so we'll accept it. And then the dramatic line tanks, and then you pick it to pieces, of course. It's Alrighty. Another interesting example of uh, how this application of technology is done is Anne McCaffrey's To Ride Pegasus series, where she has the people, they finally figure out what the key to triggering consistent psychic abilities is. And then it echoes out. At first, it's a very small things that it's being used on. Then very specific things like building the space station. But eventually, it gets to the point of, they don't make tow motors anymore. You know, they don't have forklifts because there's no reason to. You just hire a psychic to go, yes, I'm linked in. Okay, I picked that up, it's in place. And leads to mass unemployment for everybody else, but... <laughs> so, the main part of what I'm trying to say with that is, when you're writing, be aware of your world. If you add a technology, if you make a change to, to the structure of that world, 
be aware of where else that's going to affect your world. Uh, a great example is nanobots. If you have nanobots that are repairing uh, rotted metal, you know, restoring a car or whatever, why wouldn't they have nanobots that could go into the bloodstream and remove arterial plaque and repair the scarring and the damage from heart attacks and so forth? Why hasn't it revolutionized medicine? That was one of my one of my picks, even when it was new, with the classic Star Trek. They'd advanced all these other technologies, warp drive, wonderful communications technologies, computers, etc., etc. Medicine was still back about where it is now. They didn't advance it. And uh, it just never made sense to me. I mean, if you have a transporter, somebody has a tumor. Oh, all right, we'll put the transporter out. Beep, boom, tumor gone. So, again, emphasis. Look at the consequences of your tech and how it's going to affect your world in general. Um, it was a great story I heard about the ring world. Now, this is another thing that you also uh, have to take into account when somebody is going over your stories. Uh, this happened with the Ring World series, as I said. He'd written it. It was going great, very popular. And then some engineers got hold of it. And they ran the numbers. They actually took the time to do the math. And they were saying, this can't work. This won't work. You've got to do something. It's wrong. It's wrong. So the author went back and he wrote a prequel of the Ring World Engineers to answer these engineers who had actually done the math and said it was impossible. And they took it. They looked at it. They did the math again. They tore it apart, and then they said, no, this won't work, this won't work. And he just, he just threw his hands in the air and said, enough, it's fiction. So there is a degree of that, There's, you know, you can't take it too, too seriously or too, too literally. But you should try to have the thing that if somebody isn't fanatical enough to book time on a supercomputer and tear you apart, that most, most scientists are going to give it, give it a nod and let it go. I was on a panel with Eric Choi a couple of year, years ago. Eric Choi is an excellent fiction writer, and he has also a, um, worked on the Martian lander. He's one of the engineers who developed that. And uh, he was talking about how uh, you can use electromagnetic shields to deflect hard radiation. And I kind of thought about it a moment, and I said, yeah, but then doesn't it just build up in the shield, and when you finally collapse it, it all comes collapsing in, and you get a thousand years worth of radiation falling on you in ten seconds? And uh, he very, he, he just smiled, he looked at me and said, deal with one problem at a time. <laughs> Which is good. You don't have to do it. You're, you're not an engineer. You're not a scientist, unless, of course, you are. Um, but you don't have to deal with everything to be perfect in, in imagineering. You just have to be close enough that in the broad strokes, people who actually understand what's going on will go, you know, I could work it around so that would work. You know, it, it's a matter of hitting close to the bullseye. bullseye. Uh, one of my huge bugaboos on this issue, though, and this is something that should be a bugaboo for everybody as far as I'm concerned, there's a little thing called the conservation of mass. Matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed. They can simply change form. So, the conservation of mass I'll go to Marvel for this one. 
unless Spidey has a gland that secretes webbing someplace, and if you understand spider anatomy, you know where that would be, and it would make for a bad comic book. <laughs> um, we have a real problem here. Because you, in all of the stuff, all of, all of the comics, all of the video treatments, you have them shoot web, shoot web, shoot web, shoot web. And once in a while, the web shooters do run out when it's for dramatic effect. But a little canister like that, how much webbing is it going to hold? I mean, come on. Um, another one is see any creature with real-time limb regeneration. That is another one where the conservation of mass gets thrown out the window. To parallel to this, how many people know the basics of how, know what an action-reaction drive is? You do? You do? Okay. The short form is, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So in an action-reaction drive, you throw something this way, and you go that way. Simplest, easy-peasy, high school physics. Now, it drives me when you get things like, we're using an ion drive. Fine. Ion drives, known technology, proven to work. But it's still an action-reaction drive. So the question is, where's your fuel tank? And so often it's, we're using an ion drive. We don't have to have a fuel tank. We can just pull energy, mass, out of nowhere, and go And unless the new microwave, I don't know its proper name, but it's basically a microwave canister drive, microwave back, bounces back and forth in a magnetized bubble, and somehow you get thrust from it. Unless that pans out, and I don't know how you could, you don't get something for nothing. So, that's another thing of the conservation of mass, conservation of energy. Um, also, another thing to look at is how is your tech powered? What kind of energy source do you have? What sort of, uh, well, what energy? If you're in the middle of the interstellar void, what are you going to use to power yourself? And just a little bit of thought to that, nuclear, fusion, whatever, but some idea of what is powering whatever tech you're using. If you're, if you're doing Iron Man's armor, they have built suits that are comparable to, without the flight capacity, the Iron Man armor in the very early comic books. They've built exo, exo, exoskeleton suits like that, uh, the US military. But the problem is, you can't power them. You have to run an extension cord to it. Because you cannot store enough energy for the thing to operate for any realistic period of time. So have something to address that. Now that can be addressed by, by future tech. You can go, oh, well, we've developed an arc reactor. reactor. OK. But also remember that that's going to echo out into the rest of your world and have an effect on it. So yes, it advances echo out through culture and society. Um, if you want proof of this, just think of the fallout from cell phones. Uh, we have beefed up our distracted driving laws. We're talking about, and some places have put in, distracted walking laws. Uh, probably because of the result of the person who was walking along the street looking at their phone and stepped into the vacant manhole and ended up standing in the sewer with a shocked expression on their face. And I'll call you back. <laughs> uh, also, the way that any tech revolutionizes, like, like cell phones, revolutionizes the world. I'm a holdout. I don't have a cell phone. 
but I have seen so many things where it used to be very, simplicity itself, a road map. You could get road maps everywhere. Not so much now. Um, telephones. How often do you see a payphone? They used to be so common. And now, they're becoming progressively rarer. And pretty soon I'm going to have to give up my stubborn one-man crusade and get one of the blasted cell phone things. Okay, um, the way computers have revolutionized the world. Again, it's echoes out of technology. Now when you take this to the fictional concept, again, with uh, nanobots, I had a person, I was critiquing a story for once, and she talked about the person's dirty comb. And I told her, you know, you want to have, tell people that you're in an advanced world here, not the everyday. This is a perfect place. The gre grease trap in his nano foam, uh, in nano foam, was full and needed to be emptied. Just that little line would have immediately cemented the reader into the future world that she was working on. And it fit with the other technologies that she had in ready display. Uh, look at how it's going to affect the everyday. Uh, another great one. Okay, so that's coming up. Self-driving cars. Who can think of a major area of our society that's going to get hit by that? Taxi cab business? Taxi cabs. They're going to become a thing of the past. Um, Handicap buses for a lot of people. Yep. That's going to be way of the Mohican. Uh, yeah, wait for it. <laughs> yeah. NASCAR's going to go the way of harness racing. Yeah. It'll yep. still be around, but it's not going to be as interesting like harness racing. It's still there, but it doesn't have the big fan base. Yep. It's really, it is going to change the world. Now, we already have, in Australia, automated tra uh, truck trains, basically, that they set them on the road, and through GPS, they're steered, and they're just allowed to drive without any driver. And this is already used by the Australian mining industry. And they traverse hundreds of kilometers. Uh, so, the other thing that I want to say is, when writing a story, I have it written here. Limitation is conflict, is story, so embrace tech limits. One of the big problems with Superman as a character, and DC ran into this and ran into this, they made him too powerful. It became the thing of, the comics were boring because if you wanted to endanger Superman, there was only one way to do it. Pull out the kryptonite. And then, they eventually somebody said, hey, magic can affect him. So, that expanded it. But, it wasn't until they actually started placing limitations on Superman that he became an interesting character. And that's why my own personal thing is Batman will always be more interesting than, than Superman because Batman is just a highly trained human and he doesn't have the extraordinary abilities. He's got a lot of money. <laughs> yes, that's an extraordinary ability. Um, so embrace the limitations of your conflict. Use it, use it to your advantage. Have fun with it. You know, if Hi, Dad. Uh, 
the spaceship ran out of gas and I'm stuck in orbit around Jupiter. Can you come help? Embrace it. The limitations are what make it interesting. Funny, dangerous, whatever. Uh, when you're writing high tech, doing these incredible constructs, it's easier to work close to home, close to what you know. Uh, the other thing you can do is just go so far in advance that, hey, any, any significantly advanced science is indistinguishable from magic. So you can go to one of the two extremes, but I prefer for the fact that you are able to get so, uh, so many limitations out of it, so much dramatic meat out of it. I prefer to stick closer to home. Um, going into that middle range, it's the good rule. A good rule is that in the middle range, many things are forgivable, but not the impossible. If we know that something is patently impossible, like a human being without any protective gear going out into space and functioning for several minutes, we know this is impossible. It's you freeze, you fry, you're mummified by the vacuum, uh, all of your body start, bodily fluid starts leaking out. Uh, it, it ain't pleasant. So, ask yourself, is it possible to do it? And even some science fiction that I've happened to like, Farscape! <laughs> I enjoy Farscape, uh, I'll be honest. Uh, but they have done some things like having <clears throat> biological creatures out in space with nothing more than a little mask over their nose and mouth. And it just sort of, no, come on. Uh, another thing is, if you're just doing an interplanetary, know, know this difference. Please know this difference. Inter, interplanetary, interstellar, intergalactic. They are not the same. Between the planets, inter between. Between the planets, between the stars, between the galaxies. Please, inner space, get word of this. They habitually do it in the <laughs> uh, Yes, I'm talking about pet peeves. Uh, and again, follow through with the logic of it. I have, uh, this is a little out of step, step, but it's another one. If telekinesis can flip cars, why aren't they wa launching satellites? It would be a lot cheaper. Just have the guy go, maybe a high stratospheric aircraft, and then he just throws the thing off with his mind. Again, the logical consequence of empowering an ability. Uh, now, in Battlestar Galactica, at least the original series, I have to admit I didn't watch too much of the uh, of the modern re remakes. I'm a bit of a classicist in a lot of ways. But one of the things that bothered me even when I was young and watching it, here they have FTL. Faster than the light travel. They move freely through space, which means their material technology has to be way beyond ours. You know, they're probably using polycarbonates for the hull, and that's all fine and good. Why do the cities look like 20th century cities? You know, why do we have these high-rise skyscrapers made out of concrete? Again, echo out of your technology. Now, there are some excuses. Um, our cities would look, if we were to apply our modern tech to building a city today, and we did it all with the new best that we have, it would look substantially different than the cities that we have. Why? 
because of resting, there's a resting capital investment in houses and buildings and so forth. So we keep the old stuff working because it's just too damn expensive to build new. But overall, that's only going to last for a couple of centuries. Uh, another thing to do is establish a tech level and stick to it for all of your all of your constructs that are new. Um, okay, in uh, Tinker's play, I have a tech level that is slightly above what we have today. A lot of things that are in prototype stages are in actual usage in that book. But I don't have anything that's really off the wall like teleportation because that's just too far out there. Uh, decide what your tech level is going to be. Stay with it. Uh, in The Legend of Korra, the sequel to The Last Airbender, they worked out a roughly 1920s technology and then enhanced it with the bending abilities that are at the core of the show. They did it so well, and they implied things. There's one, in the first episode of The Legend of Korra, she's stowed away on a ship, and being transported on that ship is basically a 1920s vehicle. And it's got all these key elements. And then they branch out and they have radio, but they don't have television. They have even the hokey radio announcer's voice, which came through well on those old time radios because of the tech limitations, which is a lot of why that voice became the standard. It would cut through the static. Uh, Tech feeds off tech, consistent level. If you have a telephone, the requisite te technologies to make a telephone, most of them are also requisite te technologies for powered flight. They're going to be fairly close to one another. Um, an internal combustion engine is pretty much unessential for powered flight. Because the steam engine, as wonderful as it is, its power to weight ratio is just too much to allow it to get an aircraft off the ground. Now, how not to enrage scientists? Yes, I have notes, because if I don't have notes, I fumble around like a fish, a fish on dry land. Um, first thing is research. If you want to write a near future space science fiction, Take some time to review what the uh, space drives are. You know, ion drives, that microwave drive that I mentioned earlier, uh, chemical engine drives, uh, solar sails, one of my favorites. So do some quick research onto that. Um, Apply logic and common sense. You know, if we, uh, it's one thing to say, all right, we're going to have a space elevator. Well, you do a little research into that, and you find out that the reason we don't have one right now is that we don't have the materials tech to stand up to it. We need to go the next stage in bucky, uh, bucky substances, high carbon filament substances. Uh, and go up to Bucky Strings to be able to get a substance that is strong enough to support a space elevator and hold that tension for that distance. Then again, there's no, no reason that we can't. There is not even a theoretical construct that says we could not make these given time. We simply have to come around to it. So as you're on advancing attack, be aware of that. Be aware of what we can do well, what we should be able to do in the next 50 or so years. Um, follow past your story. 
uh, this is another aspect of technology. If you take water from a river upstream, does it mean drought downstream? And again, this is just a matter of looking at your story and following the consequences of what you do with it. And you always do that. By the way, um, if anybody wants to stop me, ask a question, anything, feel free. I can locomote a little bit, and I do apologize for that. Um, consequences, again, I'm harping, but it's important. Look at the consequences of your new tech. If you have nuclear power, the wave of the future, nuclear waste dump, Olympic size nuclear waste dump, short term facility, what the hell are we going to do with it long term? Oh, let's pour it down a mine shaft. Oh, wow, water flows down. So the water dribbles onto it, and you have nuclear steam shooting out of the mine shaft. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Yes. Follow the consequence. Follow the logical chain of events and step out of the... Uh, okay, one of the things I will say, there is scientific propaganda. Many scientists, they're, they're human beings, they've got to put bread on the table, they've got to make a living, and as such, they will become apologists for whatever is going to pay the rent. It happens, it's unfortunate, but it's reality. And I'll tell you this, there's something equivalent in every field of human endeavor. You do what pays the rent. But be aware of that, so look at both sides of the issue as opposed to just becoming an apologist for one side if you want to build a realistic world. If you want to build something that is going to make the oil companies happy, well, then you can just take one side of the issue. Uh, and again, if it gets you published and it's paying the rent, you may well do that. Okay. I had an interesting one regarding tech with a, sci with a scientist, the uh, germ guy. He has a uh, internet video show where he discusses healthy bacteria and our symbiotic relationship with uh, bacteria and the fact that we have gone so much to kill the bad germs that we're killing the good germs and making ourselves sick. Um, I bumped into him a while back and I was talking to him about Tinker's Plague and I said, well, would you mind reviewing it? And he said, Tinker's Plague, oh, it's not zombies, is it? And I said, no, diarrhea. And he looked at me and said, what? I said, more people die of diarrhea in a day than die of AIDS in a year. It's, and he said, yeah, I know. And the implication was, I'm surprised you did. And then uh, I, said, I told him, well, you know, I'll let you in. The plague is racially specific. And he just went, oh, it is. And I said, yes, well, you see, what I've done is I've designed it so that the one virus hides against the MHC protein markers on the outer shell, shell of, the, uh, of the cell, which opens it up, and that, cell, uh, that virus is fairly robust, which opens it up for a very delicate virus that inserts itself into the cell and normally could not penetrate the MHC protein markers, but it can penetrate the other virus. So it goes in, it replicates, and then it causes the cell to dump fluids and the person dies of dehydration, effectively. And he's just, you just there was just this moment of, I'll give you the review. <laughs> gave me a stellar review. Very nice man, too. But that's the thing that a little bit of research and a little bit of attention to detail regarding your constructs, be they microscopic or macroscopic, can do.
for your fiction. Uh, so, popular science is a great source. Uh, you can get it free on the internet. Also, be very careful about the internet because, well, there's a plethora of wonderful information out there. There's also every crackpot theory you're ever going to find, so double check. Uh, Wikipedia is wonderful for getting the proper spelling of words. Go to the Encyclopedia Britannica if you want something serious. Uh, documentaries are wonderful for sparking ideas and giving you enough key points that you can uh, make something work. Most people, if you can find somebody who works in the field, most people, as long as you don't make a pest of yourself, are only too happy to answer a few simple, well-phrased questions. Show them that you've done enough of your homework that you are an informed layman. And they'll happily fill in the uh, more advanced areas that you may just need so that you're not tripping over something. Uh, textbooks are a little harder because a lot of the time if you're reading a textbook, you've got the textbook here and you've got a dictionary here. Because people do love to use technical language. I mean, bilateral periorbital ecchymosis. Two black eyes. But I've known plenty of medical personnel who would use bilateral periorbital ecchymosis in front of a uh, lay person just because it makes them look big. <laughs> okay. You don't need to be an expert to know what tech can do. Uh, can do. More importantly, you don't need to be an expert to know what it can't do. Uh, coming back to the space elevator. If you try to make a space elevator using steel cable, there's a basic uh, principle, I couldn't give you the math on it, but what it comes down to is the longer the rope, the greater the stress. So there's a limitation to how much strain you can put on a steel cable. Uh, and that limitation goes down the further it is. If you're going 2,500 kilometers, kilometers or miles, uh, into orbit, it's just beyond the capacity of tempered steel. You can't do it. Bucky cable, there you have some, there you have the possibility. Uh, okay. An LED. It's not gonna run an easy bake oven. You know, LED lights are great, highly efficient, light up a room, that's great. But if you want to cook those little muffins from the premix pre pack, and you're going to go back to the old incandescent. Um, now this also, there is some wiggle room. Because science is fluid. Uh, I'll take, draw the example from paleontology, which had the old man of paleontology who bullied everybody into saying, that is a brontosaur for basically his entire life. And finally, when he died, a bunch of the younger paleontologists stood up, took the damn wrong head off the thing, and said, it's a brachiosaur. And the brontosaur drifted into infamy and is now very much forgotten. Um, Another example for paleontology, and this actually came into Rob, Rob Sawyer's uh, Quintagalo series of books. For a time, they had found a, what appeared to be a small tyrant, tyrannosaur with fairly long arms. And they had decided that this was a separate species. And that they had found what they dubbed nanotyrannosaurus because it had some similarities to Tyrannosaurus rex, but it was much smaller, had the longer arms. And Rob Sawyer, 
well, wrote a book where the Earth's ecosystem prior to the Great Cretaceous extinction had been scooped up and moved to a moon orbiting a gas giant in a distant star system. Uh, it's actually a very good um, treatment of the life of uh, Darwin and Ga Galileo, Darwin, and there was one, one of the other great scientists. Um, and it gets into this, these nanotyrannosaurs who have evolved into a sentient species. Yeah, fun books. Um, then they started saying, oh no, that's not, a, that's not a separate species. It's an immature T-Rex. And they're still debating that right now, but it kind of blew the logic base out of his books. So, uh, again, I'm coming back to what I've been harping on of look at the consequences of everything in your world, how it interreacts. <laughs> Mentally walk through your world. Don't rush to write. Lay in bed or sit up a tree or do it when you are on a long commute and somebody else is driving. I don't recommend it doing one when you're, you're the one driving because I've shared the road with you. <laughs> Walk through your world. Close your eyes and take a walk and see how one thing leans against another. Nothing occurs in isolation. If you're on a desert planet and you have a species evolving there, is it likely that their equipment their machines will use water cooling systems like many of ours do. No, you need some alternative. Uh, follow that for any alien you're making, follow that for human technology when it's transposed to a different environment or when you've added something new. Why would some, okay, we'll go with the arc reactor again. Tony Stark. Thank you for the arc reactor. Why would anybody have A cell batteries? You know, you just, these things wear out, you plunk one of these things in, and it's the life of your, your device. And then the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one. So follow that sort of logic. But take the time to do it, take the time to walk through, to visualize, and ask yourself, is it silly? Um, well, if you have a mass nanobots doing one thing, why wouldn't they use them to clean out clogged arteries and other things? Uh, already said that. If a tech, tech does not apply, give a reason. And this is how you may want to work in limitation. Uh, religion and big money can force a tech into obscurity. Uh, you look at the Jehovah's Witness and their attitudes toward blood transfusion. For that group, a technology that saves a lot of lives is cut out and not used. So if you want to apply that to your fiction, you can, but you have to make it sure that the reader is aware of why. Uh, also, be aware of the consequence of the consequence. You ban something, you create a black market. And that's where you can get a lot of dramatic stuff too. You know, a treatment, but it's illegal. Is there a black market for that treatment? Is part of your story a parent who is desperate to get their ch child into a treatment that is illegal? Uh, also, there can be biological and technical incompa in incompatibilities. Uh, I'm thinking of some of the uh, early work, early stuff they did with dentistry of trying to do tooth transplants. And that's where they found out a lot about the rejection factors that prevent most transplants today. For the next few years, and then we're going to have pig organs that will be replaced with human, human stem cells and we will be making organs that 
we could live considerably longer than we do. And the cost availability. Uh, okay. Uh, various secret texts. I'm reminded of the James Wong fingerprint scanner in one of the old movies, and the thing filled an entire closet. They now have them. They're about that big. And it's, but um, that was 10 to 20 years of advance. Of its, in advance. Um, the materials tech affects engineering. Bronze helmets, not as effective as steel helmets. Gun re guns require at least bronze as well as gunpowder, which is something people forget, especially with hang gliders. People love to put hang gliders in a medieval setting. Well, maybe you could do it if you had bamboo and silk. They would be incredibly expensive, but you might get the straight, the, the weight rate, weight weight, lift, ratio you need. Sorry, long day. Uh, plastics are a game changer in any, any uh, society. Um, you also get weird things that happen with tech. I'm going to tell the story simply because I like it. It's a true story. My father was a research chemist. He worked in the States and one of the, was one of the few foreign nationals to ever have a top secret U.S. security clearance. In effect, if my father had a need to know it, he was allowed to know it. Well, it was the early days of the space program. And they could get, the U.S. could get stuff up, but they didn't have a clue how in hell the Russians were getting it down. Everything was burning up. So they did a spot, a spy, the spy snuck in, and he managed to steal about a piece as big as a baseball of the Russian heat shielding material. And they smuggled it out, cloak and dagger, the whole way. Then they took it to the U.S., and my father just happened to come up on the rotation of, of chemists that were allowed to do this work and he got the job of analyzing it. So he took a micro sample and he did all the tests. And he went, what? And he took another sample, he did all the tests. And he went, oh no. And he did it again. And I was like, oh, they're never going to believe this. It was Bakelite. The same stuff you make light switch covers out of. And it wasn't stopping the heat. It was an ablative shield. It would melt, dribble off the sides of the spacecraft, and carry the excess heat with it. So, as I said, maybe not pertinent, but it's a good story. <laughs> uh, but that po points out plastics do affect what you're doing. Uh, Polycarbonate hulls equal polycarbonate armor. If, and this is the other thing that factors in, economics. You can have a piece of technology that's perfectly viable and possible, but economics means that it's not going to be in general application. Uh, I loved that in the, uh, I think it was the Batman Begins movie, where he's got the suit, and it was the thing of, Oh, well, why isn't every one of our troops in this? Well, because it costs $200,000. We can do it, but it's cost prohibitive. Uh, weapon, tech, weapon tech moves to counter armor tech, and the inverse of that is true. And know how the environment will affect your tech. Does it rust? In the, novel, in the Dune novels, in the novel Dune, actually, they use sword, vibro swords to get through the shielding. And the one and artillery no longer functions because the shield has made it obsolete. Except on Dune, where you can't run a shield because it attracts sandworms. 
And this played into a major part of the dramatic line of that book. Uh, another one to keep in mind, uh, nuclear energy causes metal, metals to br brittle so that they can re reach a consistency like glass. Uh, a couple of things you can do to get, get by limit, uh, limitations. Fluke breakthroughs, but you don't want to use that too much. And reverse engineering higher, higher tech that came from someplace else. Uh, I don't know whether something crashed at Roswell, New Mexico or not. But if it did, it would certainly answer a lot of questions of why we've been able to leapfrog ahead so fast. Uh, like I said, I don't know, but it's one possibility. Uh, also, you're going to have to do supporting techs. If you have an FTL spacecraft, you're going to have to also have a hull that can stand up to the uh, micrometeor impacts or some sort of shielding system. You can't just say, oh, we're, uh, we're putting a V8 onto this buggy a V8 engine onto this buggy and calling it a car. Well, where's the transmission? You have to have those collateral techs to do what you want to do. Uh, they actually are holding space elevator uh, competitions, which involves getting an elevator from ground high up on a cable with, uh, within a certain period of time. And whoever does it fastest wins the competition. And this is to develop the collateral lifting techs that when we get the bucky cable technology we'll be able to support the space elevator. And that will be really cheap orbital flights. Uh, some techs in dirt. Uh, Viking ships, we still use split plank and Tinkerbilt. Uh, actually one of the if you're going to talk wooden boats, it's probably the best way to build a boat. Uh, Greek fire is still effective. And we use variations of that with uh, flamethrowers. Uh, no limitation of your tech. Starting a fire with uh, flint and steel is a pain in the backside. It takes longer. I like matches. Matches are good. Um, but also, remember with tech, limitation, I'll say it again, limitation equals conflict equals excitement. Use the limitations on your tech to make it exciting for your characters. Force them to come up with innovative ways to use it. And your right reader will go along with you and go, yeah, you didn't wave the magic wand. Uh, Lasers can be diverted by mirrors. We all know that. Uh, understand a little bit about the text you're using. Uh, a good one is explosions move primarily in the path of least resistance. So if you want to uh, shatter a pillar, if you just wrap gel ignite around it and detonate it, you probably won't accomplish your goal. You wrap gel ignite around it, take a piece of uh, high tensile strength, strength fabric, wrap that around it, tie it off, hit the button, that pillar is probably coming down. Because instead of all the force going, the force now hits that high strength, tensile strength fa fabric and is focused inward. Uh, little things like that. Think about the physics involved and follow through. Uh, a temp temperature effect on materials tech, cultures develop text they need. Um, no consequence of text and conclusion. Okay, I'll just think. Think about the world your tech would result in. Buggy whip factories died out because of the automobile. Self-driving cars equals death of taxi industry. And that's it. Um, 
thank you for uh, being patient and listening to me ramble on for the better part of an hour. Uh,